Good morning. Look at you all here this morning. An hour less sleep, freezing cold outside. Why don't you just give each other a hand for being here bright and early? Yeah. I don't think you're as impressed with each other as you should be. And how, and how many are glad that God got here before we did this morning, yeah? That's very good. We're starting a series called Genesis, and we're going to begin by looking at the very first couple of verses of the very first chapter of the very first book in the Bible, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and there was morning the first day. So why would we want to spend time studying Genesis? And uh, I actually am fascinated by the book of Genesis. I actually believe that the book of Genesis has had more influence on my life than any other book in the Bible. I actually think that Genesis has helped me better understand every other book of the Bible. In fact, without Genesis, I would only understand half of what Christ came to do for us. And the, the, the points that God intends for us to understand can actually be learned in looking at this very first book. So I think it's, it's incredibly exciting and it fills in the missing gaps of things that we believe. In our world, a lot of people, if they have an opinion, they consider that a belief, they're not the same thing. So when we think about God, what do we think about him? Where do we get that information? How do we know it's accurate? Genesis really helps complete a lot of that information. What we discover is everything begins with God. Everything begins with God. First verse, in the beginning, God. He's the subject of the very first sentence in the book of Genesis. And in the first chapter, he's referred to over 30 times. Now, I know that there are people who have difficulty believing that God always was. So, well, where did he come from? Well, he always was. And I had a, a college roommate, and, and uh, he was an agnostic. And uh, he used to argue this point. Where he would say, where did God come from? And I would say, he always was. And he said, how can that be? And, and I said, well, where do you think we came from? And so we went down the evolutionary scale all the way back to the Big, big Bang. And I said, and, and where did the Big Bang come from? And he said, well, from gas. I said, well, where did the gas come from? He said, there was always gas. It's just like a college male to assume that there's always been gas. You know, it's just one of those things. Uh, evolutionists all also believe that there was always something. There's no one who believes that you start with nothing because you can't get something out of nothing. Now, one of the challenges for believers is that Genesis chapter one is actually not a scientific journal. God doesn't write down all the scientific formulas as to how he created life. And I don't actually think that that's the primary purpose that Genesis 1 is here. There's valuable information, and it does help us. And there is some information about the how, and we'll get to that in a minute. But to be fair, we tend to only ask a question about how when we talk about creation. When I went and bought a car, I didn't ask how they created it. I didn't ask who engineered it. I didn't ask what plant it was manufactured in. I didn't ask how long it took. I just wanted to know how it worked. I have a smart device. I, I didn't ask where it was made. I didn't ask how long it took to make it. I didn't ask who, who created it or who engineered it. I just, how does this work and how can it help my life? And this is part of the challenge for how we approach Genesis chapter one is that often we start focusing on the how did God make everything rather than why did God make everything? And that turns out to be a really interesting passage, a really, way, a really interesting way to think about it. And the truth also is, is that if, we were to put, if God were to give us all the scientific formulas, 
We shouldn't assume that just because we're technologically advanced that we would understand them. Even people in science will tell you they're making new discoveries all the time. So God focuses on the why, why we're here. God wants you to know these things. You have been created in his image for significant purpose. This is what Genesis 1 teaches us. Uh, the, the story of human history doesn't begin with our fall. It begins with our creation. Now, in life, people want a relatively happy life. How many here would choose a happy life over a disastrous one? Okay. And for some of you, I'd, I, it explains some things, I guess. The challenge is, is that when we pursue a happy life, what we're really saying is that we want things that make our life more comfortable and we want a certain set of feelings. I want to feel happy. I want to feel joy. I want to feel complete. I want to feel relevant. I want to feel smart. I want to feel connected. I want to feel appreciated. I want to feel accepted. I want to feel approval. Like we, we go after all those things. And here's the challenge. When we make those feelings our goal, even when we achieve them, they're muted and they're very short lasting. And if you make those feelings your goal, then what happens is every time you run into complications and difficulties, you don't have a set of tools by which to deal with those difficulties. I don't know if you've heard this yet. I'm sure you figured it out. This is not heaven. You don't lose an hour of sleep and have snow on the same day in heaven. It's not how it works. So how are we supposed to navigate the challenges of life? You will not navigate if your goal is happiness. You can navigate it if your goal is meaning because meaning gives you a set of tools to face the hardships of life and it also enables you to enjoy the incredible blessings that God provides us. So Genesis actually tends to focus more on the meaning. And this is what it says. Even though we didn't read all of the verses in chapter one, just to, to save some time, I recommend that you would do it. God creates things by using his words. And this is an important concept because words requires consciousness. It requires, it's language, it's something to communicate. We're not a product of some accidental system having some kind of collision and, and here we are. So the world starts in a chaotic state, the world was in chaos. It was, there are three words used to describe this in Scripture. It was formless, it was empty, it was dark. Formless, empty, dark. And here's what I want you to know. Chaos is not limited to the universe prior to creation. Chaos is in our world right now. You probably noticed it on the news. Chaos can exist in our relationships in our families, there can be things that are empty, that are dark, that are lifeless. Chaos can exist in our body when disease strikes it. And, and, and there's, there's an attack on, on what is a healthy system. Chaos can exist in our own thoughts. They can become very dark and random and confused and disconnected. Chaos can exist in our families. Things that start falling apart, relationships are fractured. Chaos can exist in our finances, where it seems that one single upheaval can completely undo all the work and all the income that we've tried to generate and all the things that we've tried to acquire. So why do we need chapter one in Genesis? Because our world is filled full of chaos, our lives are filled full of chaos, and we only have one example in all of the universe about someone who can speak into chaos and bring order and bring life and bring beauty. That's why we need it, because we live in a world of chaos. Now, this is important. The presence of chaos does not prove the absence of God. The presence of chaos does not prove the absence of God. We are told that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This is not some kind of force or, or natural phenomenon that would create a spark of life. Deuteronomy uses this exact same word in chapter 32, and it describes an eagle that hovers over a chick and rouses them to start, to start getting out of the nest. We might assume that God is absent in chaos, but the Holy Spirit is already hovering over the chaos 
chaos of our lives and he's beginning to rouse things. He's beginning to hover. He's beginning to, to create life and shape things out of it. Just because things are chaotic does not mean that God is absent. You might not be aware of his presence. You might, might not be alert to his presence, but he is present. And God uses his words to bring order and beauty out of chaos. Lifeless, empty, dark, formless, doesn't create order out of itself. Dark does not produce light. Formlessness cannot produce form. If you spent any time in school and paid attention, I spent time, didn't pay as much attention as I should, but I did have a science teacher who taught me about the second law of thermodynamics. And what he insisted was that all closed systems maximize entropy. Our world devolves, not evolves. Things fall apart, they don't come together. So what is our solution for this? And Jesus tells us, we can't live by bread alone. We need God's word. We need God's word. God's word is the way we confront chaos in our lives. So God said, let there be light, and the universe explodes in light. When God speaks, light comes into darkness. God's word is what's going to bring illumination to the various levels of chaos that we have to engage in in our lives. And he wants us to know that his word will do that over and over again. We have a lot of dark thoughts. We have a lot of dark moments. We have a lot of dark days. We can have dark circumstances and it doesn't matter how many light switches you turn on, darkness seems to be everywhere. And we wish that we could get some information or some knowledge that would make the darkness go away. But God's word tells us what makes the darkness go away. It's his word. It's his word. God's word brings light into our lives. And he wants us to see us, for who he created us to be and the purpose that he's assigned to us. So God uses words also to create something out of nothing. And this is unique. And all of the religions of the world and all of the, the, the gods that have been named by humans, this is unique. All of the other gods create something out of something else. Maybe there's a slain deity that they create the heavens and the earth out of, or they use an animal to create the heavens and the earth out of it. In the Egyptian creation myth, there's a, there's a cosmic goose and a cosmic gander that lay a cosmic egg, and that becomes Ray. That's the god. And so that's, that's how everything else gets made in all the other religions. But only in Christianity do we see God using words to create something out of nothing. In fact, when it says God created the heavens and the earth, that word actually refers to creating something out of nothing. And it is only used of God in all of Scripture. So starting with God's word is the way to bring order, beauty into the chaotic things of our life. And if chaos isn't currently breaking into your life, it's breaking into the life of someone that you care about. So God gives us his word. It's not just religious history. It's not just a set of rules. It's not just inspiring stories to keep children engaged. God gives us his word and that word can create universes and bring light to darkness and bring life and bring beauty and bring form out of utter chaos. How many are glad that God's word still does that today? Still does that today. So people ask, why, why do I feel so empty? Why do I feel so hopeless? Why do I feel so, why, why is, is darkness closing in on me? And the answer is chaos is constantly at work in our world. We fear because we know how chaotic things can get. We become angry because we know how chaotic things can get. So the modern approach for this, this is what we're told, is you go find yourself a mirror and you look deep inside. And deep inside you will find the light and you will find the love and you will find the order and you will find the beauty. And you will, do you know what will happen if you look deep inside? You will find darkness. And you will find chaos. And if you haven't found it yet, you haven't looked very long. What are we looking at? Have you thought about this? 
When was the last time you stood outside and looked into a starry, endless sky and let your thoughts go where they might go? We, we don't do that much anymore. We look at these little screens. Say, not me, Pastor. I got a 65 incher on my wall. Yep. Do you know how big that is compared to the sky? Really small. Why does that matter? Because on all of these screens, there are voices that are telling us what we should think and how we should behave and what we should look like and who's doing better than us and what's wrong with our world and what's wrong with us. And all of these voices do not change chaos. They actually add to the chaos. But there is a voice that makes a difference and speaks beauty and life and peace into our world. And that voice comes from God. If you want to start thinking different thoughts, start looking at something other than smart screens. They're not that smart. They're not. This is, an anti this is not an anti-technology message. I use technology. Thanks to technology, I got up on time today. That's how that works. I'm grateful for it. That's not the point. But the point is, I will not solve the chaotic and the darkness realities of my life by staring at screens where other humans are telling me their opinions or their frustrations and saying it in ways that gets me all caught up in it. If I want a really different view of life, it won't come from a mirror and it won't come from a screen. It will come when I look to the God who creates the heavens and the earth and I listen to the words that he has to say. That makes all the difference in the world. That's a really good place for an amen. amen. Yeah. So chaos might be unavoidable, but God's word is always available. And, G and God's word says it will never return void. Second Timothy puts it this way. All scripture, all scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word, all of it, it's God breathed. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It can even penetrate to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes, the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. In Matthew 4, Jesus said this, it is written, man shall not live, cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need God's word. Now, there's an interesting thing here too, and that is that in creation story, we see that at the end of each day, God says something, and he says that it's good until he gets to the sixth day. And then when he made people, he said, that's very good. So what does that mean? Is this a quality control expression? Has he done an evaluation and inspection? Sun, moon, stars, good. Water, land, good. Passes inspection. Birds, fish, animals, good. Meets my expectation. Is that what God is doing here? No. This isn't a quality control. Have you ever had a phenomenal meal? Yeah? And what did you say? That, that meets my expectation. No, 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 no. You said that is good. That is so good. That is so good. We have a friend that when they comes over to our house, he always eats two to three times what I eat. And almost every other word, he just talks about how good the cooking is. My wife loves it when he comes to our house. He just, he consumes everything. I'm a little frustrated because there's no leftovers when he goes. It's, it's all gone. I, but this is what's fascinating is I knew that guy when he was growing up and he found a complaint at every meal he ever sat at when I knew him as a kid. And he's, he's become this, oh, this is so good. Have you ever had a really good cup of coffee? Oh, it is so good. Have you ever read a really good book? 
Oh, this is so, in fact, when we experience something, we want to savor it, we want to relish it, we want to celebrate it, and we usually want to share it with somebody else. We listen to really good music. That is so good. What is going on? We're not just assessing its quality, we're enjoying it. And this is what I want you to know about God. When God created us, he wasn't just checking boxes and say, sun, moon, and stars, done. All the, he, he's not checking boxes. When he, when he creates, he looks at what he has created and he claps his hands and he sings. In fact, most biblical scholars believe that Genesis 1 is actually a song. That's why you get those repetitious phrases in it. That God is actually singing a song because he's celebrating. All of heaven is applauding. All of heaven is dancing. All of heaven is singing. If you want to know what God thinks about creation, about our world. Look at Genesis 1. I know there are lots of voices on tiny little screens with very loud voices that are telling us all that's wrong with our world and how bad everything is. But God in heaven is clapping his hands and he's dancing for joy and he's singing a song of celebration because he knows what he made is good. How many think we need that word in our world today? Yeah, well, it's true even if you don't say amen. Yeah. So God ends each day just by savoring and enjoying. Now, a lot of religions will actually tell us that the material world is a problem and we need to escape it. And that's our goal in our spiritual journey. That's not what Genesis 1 teaches us. Genesis is not, by the way, Genesis is not the only account in scripture of creation. There's multiple accounts of creation in scripture. You can find one in the gospel of John, first chapter. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. That life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only one and only son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ is the word of God come into our world. He has come to bring life and beauty and order to our chaos. He wants to give us life to the full. God still has something to say to us in our world. And he sent Jesus to say it. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word never will. So I've got too much chaos in my life. What you should know is that's the material that God usually starts with. The spirit starts hovering over and he begins to speak something that changes everything. If your life is a chaotic mess, you're in a perfect situation for God to speak to you. Please hear that. Because you have probably been told that because your life is a chaotic mess, God won't speak to you until you get your act together. And that is not true. I'm going to have the worship team come out. So, how are we to use God's word? Here's what I want you to think about. In fact, I'd like you to start a practice if you don't already have it. Begin each day with God's word. Begin each day with his word. Whose words are you beginning your day with? News? Sports? Really? Do you think that information is going to bring light to darkness? and life to lifelessness, and form to formlessness, and beauty to chaos. It's going to take God's word. Focusing on a brief passage from scripture can have an incredible influence on the rest of your day. Said, well, I tried it, I didn't feel, don't, no, 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 don't do that. Don't make this about how you feel. 
You don't go to God's word to get a feeling. You go to God's word to position yourself for the chaos you're going to face that day and have something inside of you that enables you to walk into the very dark and lifeless places and bring the light and love of Jesus to all of it. That's why we do that. You want a feeling? Start your day with God's word and walk into the chaos in front of you and watch what God does with it and you'll get the feelings. You'll get the feelings. And then second, continue your day by inviting God's Spirit. What words are you going to speak today? What words are you going to speak today? Because the chaos of our world is not going to get better by our silence. It's not an accident that the first and most significant thing that happens in our birth is that our voice is lifted up. It's at that cry that everyone knows life has come into the world. Your voice matters and your silence will not make things better. I know you've been told that. If you speak, you'll just make the chaos worse. The chaos is what it is, but you can have words to speak that bring life to it. Our silence will not work. We can start by talking to God. Focus on a passage, His Word orients you for what you need for the day and speak to God and repeat the words of God. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand right now. And I'm going to ask you to identify two people in the room. I don't care where they are. And you're going to put one hand towards one person and the other hand towards the other person. All right, let's just go ahead. Just do that right now. Two people. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to repeat these words after me. May God our Father. Let's try that again. Let's declare it. Let's try it again, rather. May God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you strength and peace. Amen. Amen. That simple act can make a difference in our lives. Father, would you help us today to be hearers of your word and repeaters of your word so that the chaos of our world can experience your light, your purpose, your life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, one more time, let's sing, I won't bother.